Hello, everyone, and welcome to In Conversation, Artists Consider Dorothy Lang, which is part of our Oakland Museum of California's new installation in the Gallery of California Art, Dorothy Lang Photography as Activism. I'm your host, Patricia Carino Valdez, and I'm part of the public engagement team here at OMCA. I am joined by my amazing colleagues, Amy Johnson, Donor Events Manager, and our stage manager today, David Cruz from our AV team, and Todd Quackenbush and Austin Wayanecki Wang from our membership department. We are honored to share this space with you and are grateful for this time together. Today's talk considers the role of art and activism in social justice movements. We hope that this talk inspires you and provides you with some ideas and strategies for how art can bear witness to the injustices in our world. We will learn about the ways in which Dorothea Lang's photography has influenced local contemporary artists. We are so thrilled to have with us today Bay Area artist Hung Lu and photographer and videographer Paul Kitagaki Jr. in a discussion led by OMCA's curator, photography and visual culture, Drew Johnson. If they'd like to join us, that would be great. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Each person will share a short presentation followed by a moderated conversation together in which we'll share your questions and comments with them. The program is approximately 50 minutes long. Before I hand the mic off, I'd like to share a few short bios from our special guests. San Francisco Bay Area artist Paul Kitagaki Jr. has traveled the world covering natural and human disasters. His work has been honored with dozens of photo awards, including the Pulitzer Prize and has been nominated for Emmys. He's been published in news outlets worldwide, including National Geographic, Time, Smithsonian Magazine, Sports Illustrated, Mother Jones, The New York Times, as well as his home paper, The Sacramento Bee. His project, Gambete, Legacy of Enduring Spirit, documents and illuminates a dark episode of our country's history, the relocation and the internment of more than 120,000 ethnic Japanese Americans. Kitagaki has spent the last 15 years locating those families who lived through the internment camps, documenting their stories of survival and inner strength to overcome injustice, racism, and wartime hysteria. He will share more about this later today. In 2014, he was featured in the PBS film American Masters, Dorothea Lange, Grab a Hunk of Lightning, on the life and times of the woman whose work sparked his own dream. Born in Chongqing, China, in 1948, a year before the creation of the People Re People's Republic of China, Hung Lu lived through Maoist China and experienced a great leap forward in the Cultural Revolution. Trained as a social realist, painter, and muralist, she came to the United States in 1984 to attend the University of California, San Diego, where she received her MFA. One of the first people from mainland China to study abroad and pursue an art career, she moved to Northern California to become a faculty member at Mills College in 1990, where she is now Professor Emeretta. She has continued to live and work in the Bay Area. Her work has been exhibited internationally at premier museums and galleries, and her work resides in prestigious private and institutional collections around the world. Drew Johnson, our very own curator of photography and visual culture at the Oakland Museum of California, um, where he's worked since 1989. He has many exhibitions, at, uh, he has curated many exhibitions at the museum, including Capturing Light, Masterpieces of California Photography, 1850 to 2000, Fertile Brown, Art and Community in California, and Dorothea Lange, Politics of Scene, which traveled to London, Paris, as well as America, several American venues. Among his many duties is guardianship and sharing of Dorothea Lange archive and collection, which holds more than 6,000 vintage prints and 40,000 negatives, along with personal correspondence, field notes, proof sheets, and working documents from the artist. He is the recipient of a California Book Award for the catalog Capturing Light. A native Californian, he has been a student of photography since purchasing his first daguerreotype at the age of 14. Please join me in welcoming everyone. Now I'll hand it off to Drew. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I want to start off uh, with this, just a few quick words about Dorothea Lang and the Dorothea Lang Archive and Collection at OMCA. Um, Dorothea Lange is internationally recognized as one of the most important photographers of the 20th century. 
Uh, but what a lot of people don't recognize or realize is that her entire career, she was based in the Bay Area, in Berkeley or San Francisco. And when she passed away in uh, 1965, the following year, her husband donated her entire collection that, that Patricia was just talking about, 40,000 negatives, 6,000 prints, and all her personal papers and memorabilia. So we, uh, OMCA really is the central uh, for Lang. Uh, we can start with the, the first slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the exhibit that opened um, uh, early this year called Dorothea Lang Photography as Activism, and it sort of picks up uh, uh, from the traveling exhibition, Dorothea Lang Politics of Seeing, and looks at her work uh, through the lens of photography as a form of social activism. Dorothea Lang was committed to the idea that if people could only see injustice and she could use her incredible talent to help them see injustice, uh, they would become aware and they might even be motivated to do something about it. And so we, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, we've done, we've tried to convey that. She has this vast body of work, a, a six, 50, 60 year career, but we've decided to, the best way to illustrate the theme of this is to look at three main bodies of work, starting with the Great Depression. This is the work that she's the best known for. Um, I'm sure you've all had photographs like such as Migrant Mother in your high school textbooks that are made by Dorothea Lang. And it's really, she has provided us with the visual image and impression of what those Dust Bowl times were like. She really, um, along with, uh, she provided the visual accompaniment to the novels of John Steinbeck and the songs of Woody Guthrie. I think it really is her, her uh, vision of that era that we've internalized. Um, as she said, the, the good photograph is not the object. The consequences of the photograph are the object. Next slide. Throughout, we've, it's interesting, her origins are as a San Francisco portrait photographer. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. And, and um, as she said, when the depression hit, she couldn't reconcile what she was doing in her studio with what was happening on the streets outside. So one day, on a, purely on impulse, she grabbed her camera and went into the street and um, recorded scenes of Depression era San Francisco. Next slide. And eventually this work caught the attention of first the state of California and then the federal government, Roosevelt's New Deal programs and agencies uh, joined the Farm Security Agency, which was dedicated to making people aware of the plight of Dust Bowl refugees and migrant farm workers, that whole Grapes of Wrath story, uh, in the hopes that people and especially Congress would be motivated to actually do something about it, particularly in the form of establishing good, safe sanitary camps for migrants. Next slide. Throughout the exhibit, we've grouped her photographs, something that she felt very strongly was something necessary, uh, that a, a group of photographs could be more powerful than an individual photograph. We've grouped photographs around themes that were important to her, such as strong women. Uh, one of the things that was her special talent was the ability to emphasize the strength and resilience and individuality of people that she was photographing. And I'm sure this has to do with her origins as a portrait photographer, where the whole idea is to work with people to sort of show them as they wish to be seen. Uh, this really makes her different from a lot of documentary photographers. Next. So uh, as I said, the, the, her record of the, uh, the Dust Bowl and the refugees fleeing to California has become the standard vision of the way we think of those years. Next. Uh, she wrote photographed people on the road and uh, we used throughout the exhibit, we use quotes from her and from the people she photographed, which she was very rigorous about writing down verbatim. The people, she spent a lot of time with people talking about them and getting their experience in their own words. Next. We've, uh, uh, sometimes the quotes accompany individual photographs, sometimes they are enlarged on the wall. And this is a particularly important one where she said, I never steal a photograph, never. All photographs are made in collaboration as part of their thinking as well as mine. Again, this is her legacy as a portrait photographer. Next. Migrant farm labor, labor of course, was the subject. She happened to be married to a UC Berkeley sociologist who's, uh, whose specialty was studying Morgan farm workers. And this is a really one of my favorite quotes. They're aiming at keeping fellows such as me right down on our knees. We've got no more chance than a one-legged man in a foot race. Next. One of the most interesting bodies of work is when the Farm Security Administration sent her to the Deep South to photograph um, um, agricultural life down there. 
And one of the uh, not so subtle messages she got from her bosses was that she really should not focus too much on the topic of race relations and uh, the, uh, the basically this was 1936, 37, the height of Jim Crow. And of course, she characteristically completely ignored that advice. The, the theory was that if people, uh, that if Americans, uh, that if the, if the agency showed concentrated focus too much on racial matters, that there would be, it would be harder to raise sympathy to help people. Well, of course, she rejected that notion completely. Next. As I say, this was the height of the Jim Crow era. And uh, there's a fascinating pair of portraits right here. On the left is titled White Southerner. The right is titled, her title was Ex-Slave with a Long Memory. And uh, it's, uh, keep in mind, this is the 1930s. There are still a great number of people in the South who had direct personal experience of slavery. And you see the quote below, what was it like to be a slave when it's midnight and it's raining and he say, go, you go. Uh, just one of the examples of how she uh, ignored the advice and orders of her superiors. Next. Records of plantation life. Uh, the type of uh, agriculture that she was photographing was very different from what she saw in California. California had fac big factory farms uh, with seasonal migrant farm labor that was, they were cut loose when they were, when they were off season and not needed. In the, in the South, you had tenant farmers and sharecroppers that were tied to landlords in a way that was really not very different from slavery in a lot of respects. Next. Second body of work that we look at has to do with the home front during World War II and two projects in particular that sort of the captured two different sides of the home front experience. Next. The first was a project that she worked on documenting the incredible manufacturing the construction of warships at the Richmond shipyards, the Kaiser shipyards in Richmond, California. Uh, this was an incredible, it's referred to as the second gold rush because thousands of people poured into the state and into the Bay Area looking for these well-paying jobs, building warships at an incredible rate. Uh, and in many cases, they were the same folks that she had photographed, uh, either white refugees fleeing the Dust Bowl or black refugees fleeing Jim Crow South. Next. It was a, and the Richmond shipyards was an integrated workforce where you get the sense of everybody pulling together to fight fascism. But then the dark side of the home front, of course, had to do with rounding up citizens of Japanese descent, 120,000 descent to basically concentration camps, prison camps uh, throughout the West. She was hired on this for this project by the War Department. They seem to have wanted her to present a version of the internment that was reassuring to people that folks were not being abused. But of course, she saw it for the great injustice that it was and was violently opposed to it. Consequently, the photographs she took uh, were censored and impounded by the government for the duration of the war. Next. Most of the photographs from this series are taken in the Bay Area where people are being rounded up in preparation of sent to the camps. But she also did a series of photographs at Manzanar uh, the internment camp on the uh, far side of the Sierras. Next. And then finally, the third group is, has to do with her ongoing project of documenting the, uh, the, 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 what she saw as massive changes in social life happening to the Bay Area and by extension the nation following World War II, uh, particularly urbanization. Uh, and we look at that through a project called the Public Defender. She identified this young, idealistic Alameda County public defender named Martin Pulich and shouted him for about a year and a half, had incredible access to interviewing clients in jail cells in the, uh, in the courtroom, photographed the jury, the judge, the families of, uh, of the defendants and so on. And as she said, uh, the public defender was a defender by choice. He could make a lot more money in private practice, but he was dedicated to the proposition that everybody deserved their day in court and should not be judged by the worst thing that they'd, they'd ever done. She identified with his idealism. Next. And I wanted to give also an example of the type of label we're using, this case having to do with the public defender. A lot of the public defender images have to do with law enforcement. That's a Oakland police officer's badge on the left, paired as Dorothea loved to pair images with an image of young men walking on the streets of Oakland. And we put it with the caption, protection or oppression. History often rhymes. Lang took these photographs in the 1950s. Do they provoke feelings about present day tensions between police and black communities, communities of color? What about your community? 
One more slide. Uh, I just wanted to quickly, the next, uh, quickly call out uh, a couple of interactives that we have in the exhibit. One is Alette's visitors crop photographs, which is one of her favorite things to do. Take the same photograph and crop it multiple ways to make it more powerful. And then sequencing of images and pairing images with quotations to tell a powerful story. And this is a magnet board where visitors can sort of play with that process. Of course, when we reopen, unfortunately, we're gonna have to essentially rope this off for at least until the pandemic has has settled down somewhat, but uh, I promise you we will reopen it. So that's a very quick uh, summary of the exhibit. Uh, you can also visit parts of it online. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Kitakaki Jr., who's going to talk about his own practice and its relation to the work of Lang. Thanks. Okay. Hi, Drew. Okay, hi, Drew. And I wanted to thank you and the Oakland Museum for uh, letting me, allow me to share my work with you. So this is the name of my exhibit I've been working on for 15 years. Um, we go to the next slide. So, you know, 50 years ago, 1970, um, I started out with a long, long, a long journey with Dorothy Lang. And at the time, I didn't know, I was only 16 at the time. And um, my first intersection was I was 16, I was in American history class and I'd learned in my American history class a story that my parents had never told me. The Japanese Americans were locked up during World War II and put in concentration camps. And the second intersection was when um, I went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. in 1984, and I was looking for, looking through the, her photographs. And my third intersection has been like for the past 15 years. I've been searching for the identity of a lot of the Dorothy Lang photographs and her, her subjects she took during the incarceration. And photographing them today and then learning more about who those people were in the, her photographs. Next. So as you can see, Drew was talking about um, a lot of her photos were impounded. This is like one of, one of the photographs. So when I was a child or a kid, I grew up in South San Francisco and San Francisco, but we drive past on the El Camino, past the uh, Tanfran racetrack, which is now a shop, the Tanfran Shopping Center in San Bruno. And um, at the time, my parents didn't say one word about that. Next. And my this is San Bruno, Tamperan. Um, so at the time, my parents said nothing about it. And I didn't know that my grandparents and parents were locked behind Bob wire during World War II and they were moved from their homes. And they lived in these poorly built buildings in desolate and harsh conditions um, with 120,000 other Japanese Americans during, war, during World War II. And which was amazing, two thirds of them were um, American citizens. Next. Um, so Lang had led, has led me on this really long journey that I didn't know about. This is also San Bruno. Next. Next. So Lang's images have led me on this long life journey, discovering, sharing, and photographing the subject in her photographs. Next. Um, and I, I was hoping to give a voice to the original, you know, to the people in the original images and share their stories today. And a lot of them had said, which was so important, we hope that this doesn't happen to anybody else again in America. Next. And so this book, um, when I was a teenager, I wanted to know more information at the time. There's only two books, Americans Concentration Camp, and then this book came out. And in this book, Executive Order 9066, by, published by the California Historical Society, it had so many more, so many, it had really the visual diary of what happened. This is the first time I'd seen that. And many of those photographs were like really powerful Dorothy Lang photographs. Next. So her images really, I mean, they just popped off the page with me with emotion. I mean, she was just incredible. Uh, next. 
And, you know, at the time, early in my, early before I started photography as a career, I'm, I was a, I was a music major and I was hoping to be a musician. And, um, but eight years later, 1978, I started as a, my career as a photojournalist. Next. Um, you know, she was one of my photography heroes. And I just found this gentleman like two years ago. It took me years of searching. I mean, this is one of my favorite photographs of her that she shot of this grandson and the grandfather. And there's, his story was incredible what happened with her family. Uh, next. Um, this is the Mochita family. And you can see everybody at the time was wearing a tag with a number. And so everybody was really reduced to a number in a tag. Next. Um, so my uncle Dorothea Lang had told me, he was a San Francisco artist, he told me that Dorothea Lang had photographed our family. Next. And so 1984, I went to the National Archives, like I mentioned before, and I searched through over 900 of uh, Dorothy Lang's images. And next. And I found this picture of my grandparents and my dad and my aunt. And this was taken in Oakland. They were leaving their home on uh, Piedmont Avenue. My grandfather had a dry cleaning business. And I was, I was always a mystery to me why my grandparents were smiling during this during this moment. And you can see they're all dressed in their Sunday best. And later on, I came to find out that the woman who's there, her name is Dorothea Hightower, <clears throat> excuse me, was a family friend and her family had stored a lot of their personal belongings um, when, they, when they left for camp. Next. And I also found these other, um, there's a total of four photographs that Dorothea Lang had taken of my family. The two on the bottom, my Aunt Kimiko, and she's standing by the family possessions in Oakland before they went to Tamfran, um, which is in San Bruno, and then later to the Topaz camp, which is in the Utah desert. And in the top pit, upper right photo is another picture of my uncle who helped start the library in um, Tamfran. And he also, <clears throat> excuse me, he worked on a literary magazine called Trek with Mini Okubu, who's another artist in San Francisco. Next. Um, so, so starting with these blank photographs, many of them had no IDs on the back. So it was really hard to identify who was in the photographs. And I came to learn that when she was working, she had a hard time with the officials because she had uh, somebody help her, but they, they kept on pushing her on and to move on. And so she couldn't really talk to her reception, get more like caption information, like names and a little more background. Next. So this is like what you would see on the back of the photograph in the, in the National Archives. And as you, as you could see, there's not really a lot of information, it just had like a date and a place, but really um, no names. Next. And so what, it, what happened is like, you know, after, after the war, many of the community did not come back to the Bay Area or LA. They, a lot of people ended up in New York, the Midwest, Chicago. And so it was really hard to track everybody down. Next. Um, sorry. So many, um, so many of my subjects, they were um, older and they're really reluctant to, when I called them up to try to find them, um, I had to take my pictures to like a church or different churches and stuff. I said, do you recognize any of these, anybody's in those photos? And that's how I kind of got to start on trying to find out who were in the photographs. And this is the family who heard their uncle had put up that sign, on, I'm an American. That's in downtown Oakland um, in Chinatown. Next. So this is one of my favorite, one of my favorite Lang photographs. I mean, the symbolism of these kids pledging allegiance. This is in San Francisco at Ra Ra Raphael Wiles School. And this is like, in April, just days before their, their families were to be um, sent to the concentration camps. Next. And what was really incredible, um, I found out that um, Helena, the woman on the left, her father owned the American fish market in San Francisco's Japantown. And that was like the grocery store that like my mom would shop for in San Francisco. And the other incredible thing about both two women, both their parents were the dad and, and um, um, 
Marianne's father on the right were arrested by the FBI shortly after the war. And her, her, Marianne's mo uh, mom was because she taught Japanese, she's an educator, and the other, and Helena's because her dad was a businessman. And, excuse me, um, it was a really crazy connection. Next. This is um, Harvey Aitano, and he was later on in 1946 was the co-discoverer of um, the genetic cause of sickle cell anemia. And this is him taking a picture. This photo was taken in Sacramento, and he was supposed to graduate from UC Berkeley, but he couldn't because um, because everybody was locked up in camps. Next. And so, uh, like a lot of the Japanese, when I tried to call them up and say, hey, you're in this photograph, a lot of them didn't know that they're in this photograph taken by Dorothy Lang or some of the other war relocation authority photographers. And, but it took me a long time to, to talk to Harvey and let him come down to his house and visit him and, and um, share his story. But he was very shy and he would, um, he could talk about anybody else. But when it came to all his uh, medical achievements and all the stuff he did for mankind, he was very shy about talking about that. So next. Um, as you could see, I'm not to tell, I'm, I chose, this is Mitz, he's in San Francisco, and I want to read a quote to what, um, what Mitz said on that day. Um, Mitz said, we were kind of, we were being kicked out of San Francisco, and it was kind of shocking because as you grow up, you would think you're going to have certain rights of life and liberty, and I was really wishing that somebody would come and, and save us. Next. And this is Mitz years later. I photographed him in the exact same spot on Van Ness Avenue, 2020 Van Ness Avenue, San Francisco. And he was pretty incredible. Um, he went to camp. He felt like he was betrayed, but he volunteered for the um, Japanese American, um, all 442nd Japanese, it was a Japanese American, all segregated combat unit. And he fought in um, Italy and in France. And he was awarded the uh, a bronze star for his uh, bravery. Next. So, I mean, it was very challenging. It took me over seven years to find my first 12 photographs, which we displayed at the San, San Bruno Bart Station, which is a site at Tampran. And um, it, we displayed them on the 70th anniversary of the um, signing of Executive Order 9066, which is in 2012. Since then, um, this is from my exhibit at the Japanese American National Museum, we showed over 60 other um, people I had found. So from 2012 to um, 2018, I found so many more people and was able to share their stories. And I chose to use a, um, a four by five camera and black and white film to shoot my project. I wanted those, my photographs to kind of, um, Complement Dorothy Lang's in some in in a way, and I wanted the uh, and as we were talking about before, Drew was talking about um, participating. When I went to the subject's house, I would um, try to look at the original Lang photographs. A lot of times, I had to photograph everybody at their own house, not at the same location. And we try to I try to find something in the house that kind of resonated with the original Lang photographs. Um, next. So um, at that first exhibit in 2012, the bar station, I met Dorothea Lang's granddaughter, um, Diana Taylor, and she invited me to take part in the film. And then I met, uh, we photographed at, um, at the Ronald Partridge's house in Oakland. And it was really incredible because um, he's the daughter of Imogene Cunningham and my uncle, who I explained to you before, Uncle Noble, he had a uh, shoji screen shop on Grand Avenue in San Francisco and Imogene Cunningham had uh, taken his portrait and I still have a signed portrait that she had taken of him. Next. So with this book, um, my book here, Behind Bob Wider, and my exhibit, Gambate, Legacy and Enduring Spirit, I hope to keep the, um, these stories alive on the Japanese American car incarceration because um, as many of the subjects have said, we don't want this to happen again to American citizens on American soil.
And together, I think with those then and now photographs, I have Dorothy Lang's photographs from then and my photographs now, it kind of completes a circle of the story of the people in her original photographs. Next. So the 15 years I've spent on this project has been, um, you know, it's been a journey filled with um, sometimes beautiful, but also sometimes painful memories for some of my subjects. A lot of times um, during the interviews, they remembered things that they had long buried. And without the help of so many people, I, I wouldn't have had uh, found all these people and been able to photograph them. Next, and this is, oh, I'm sorry, go back one more. That's um, Hibiki Lee, that's her mom. Her mom's a famous artist. She had all these beautiful watercolors of incarceration that are in the, um, that are incredible pictures. Next. So in looking for the Japanese word that um, helped um, capture the strength and spirit of everybody who survived and that experience, I found it in this word called gambate, which means the triumph over adversity, um, never giving up, and always doing your best. And for me, it's, it's come to um, define not only their spirit and um, in this work, but also part of my life. Next. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate you sharing your practice with us. Um, next up, we have Hong Lu. I'm sorry, I was muted. Hi, everybody. Thanks uh, uh, to uh, Patricia organizing with your, your crew organizing this, uh, this uh, panel. And thanks to Drew and uh, Paul's uh, uh, presentations. I have uh, always learned a lot from that. There's uh, 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 some of my work I want to share with you, which are based on Dorothy Allen's images. First slides, please. I feel like I owe so much to Dorothy Lang. And uh, uh, first slice, uh, since uh, years ago, I, uh, I started to, my research at the Oakland Museum, Dorothy Lang's archives. And uh, I, uh, I think for her as a woman in the 30s and got you know, with her heavy equipment, got in her, her car, traveled to the worst the possible people in the worst the condition during the Great Depression. I really felt like she did, she did a heroic job. And uh, um, the, the also, uh, Drew just did uh, his pre presentation. He's uh, so knowledgeable about the history, even each photograph by Dorothy Lang, I have learned so much. So I owe all, you know, everything to uh, Dorothy Lang and Drew and the Open Museum. Next slide, please. Uh, going through the, there's not only one, uh, not just one uh, migrant mother, there's so many of them. And also people uh, fleeing the dust ball. I have, for example, like this two cup, two, couples, they both, the, both couples fled from uh, Oklahoma. We call them Okies then. And they're just so interesting. Their license plates with heart shape. Next one. And also children in this, uh, uh, you know, horrible time. And uh, they fled with the family, trapped in the car, if they're lucky, have family cars. And it's just different condition. I cannot imagine it. Uh, the homeless, probably uh, in poverty, in, in um, not poverty, I mean, uh, you know, no food, no, no roof over here, there, you know, all over them. And uh, just uh, 
just go whatever they could. So this is a very, very stunning photograph for me to view, you know, to learn Amer the most, the past, uh, not too long ago, the history of, uh, of uh, American past, you know, you know, very, very, you know, kind of a stunning, you know, uh, a, a very concrete way. Next one. And, uh, you know, for example, there's another migrant mother, Howard family, on and on. Next one. Uh, I, uh, that's another family, children, dog, and uh, the belongings loaded, and uh, just try to find uh, a way to survive. Next one. And also, I, I, I was fascinated. I, I got through the uh, Dorothy Lance binders, uh, photographs, binders of uh, the Great Depression. And uh, I went, you know, in the process going through the second time, I realized now that she, uh, she photographed a lot of, uh, you know, migrant people, family, and the uh, uh, laborers in the, in the South, slave, uh, former slaves, but also sometimes she turned her lens toward the sky. And so those clouds also made me think, like, you know, there's a still, there's a hope, there's an open sky, the skies are bearing witness of the history. Next one, please. So based on, um, you know, my research. I've seen so many photographs and, uh, and I did some, uh, you know, so far maybe a few hundred paintings based on Dorothy Lance images. Uh, the, this one, for example, you saw the picture of the couple, yeah, from Oklahoma. Next one, another, another couple. But uh, today, because of the limited time, I would just share uh, you know, um, only the parts I have uh, uh, done with the children's images based on Dorothy Lance photos. Next one, please. Over a uh, hundred years ago, very famous Chinese writer Lu Xun, uh, after, you know, talk about the exposed the terrible society, the, 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 the you know, uh, things happened to adults and children. The end of one his article, he said, save the children. So I, I, I felt like uh, children, uh, they are our future. But uh, these children in Dorothy and Lance images, uh, photographs, they were our ancestors. They, so it's very interesting. They could have been our great grandparents, our parents. So somehow, I think that the children, they, they were children then, they not anymore. Uh, also, the children, but they still bear the burden, the anxiety, but also dignity, like Dorothy and I always talk about the dignity of people. So this is one of the paintings and the children trapped in the car traveling. Next one, please. And then I, I, I love it. all kinds of faces that she, she focused on, like a Mexican field worker, a uh, uh, Filipino, you know, man worked in the field and the, the blacks from the South and the Mexican young little girl worked in a, a farmhand and uh, even a uh, uh, dis disabled girl during the migration. Next, please. And the young girl barely, you know, I, she, she probably just after she could walk, she worked in the in the field also have learned so many not just the visual history of america the the, the past but also a lot of terms like what is shared broker uh, uh what 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 is a uh, window steve which uh, drew gave gave me so much information as a great teacher <laughs> and next one please and uh, you know children from the south, next one. And uh, this is another well-known enough my migrant mother holding a baby and uh, the baby, you know, its face. I, I, what I, I hear, I'm, I'm, I'm doing children, not just 
hey, cute baby, but uh, they, they are children, but they also full of anxiety, full of, uh, they, they somehow, they grow up fast, almost they have an old person's face to share uh, the hardship with their family, but also the children at the same time. And uh, with all the lines and colors, I felt like I'm uh, uh, doing topography of each face. It's, there's, uh, there's so many forgotten stories and, uh, and behind this. Next one. This is another portrait from the South. You can see, again, I'm talking about the, all the colorful lines because the, as you know, Dorothy Lance photograph are in black, white. So that gave me a, a, some, uh, you know, a lot of freedom to improvise. Okay, next one. And the Paul, Paul's, uh, uh, Great project following Dorothy Allen's uh, uh, traits is great. I also was uh, so taken by the images like this of Dorothy Allen took the photograph of uh, Japanese Americans was sending away with the name tag, you know, here. Next one. So I, I, I did, uh, you know, some paintings based on that, like the the two sisters ready to be shipped away with their family. Next one. And uh, this is a, also Drew shared with me, Oakland Museum spot was one of the uh, a spot for um, the government to get the Japanese Americans to uh, together and then shipped away. So now the, uh, now it's Oakland Museum, 10th and Oak. This, uh, a Japanese American little girl, a Siva forgotten with all the luggage, you know. It's like she almost like a piece of luggage to be uh, waiting for, 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 the, for, the, for the fate. Okay, next one. And uh, this is a we, <laughs> problem Paul we share. I, this is one of my, uh, not you can say favorite, the photograph because it says so much is the, uh, uh, my elementary school uh, group of children, with some of them are Japanese Americans, they pledge uh, allegiance to the, you know, of course, to the flag. That time in 1942, there were 48 flag, uh, stars. So I, uh, as you can see, the, the, there is a really, I love the country. I pledge allegiance to you. Do you love me? Do you? You know, do you think I'm American? And so there says so much about this. Next one. And uh, even though in the hardship, I still feel the strength, you know, the, the dignity of, of uh, migrant people, suffering people, even children. So this is a, a two uh, siblings, I guess, sleeping on the mattress on top mattress in the family car fleeing, you know, from dust ball and the Dorothy Airlines club underneath. So they, they above the club, they still have American dream. Next one. And uh, this most recent finish, another girl, you know, also on mattress on top of the car. Next one. And choose children are resilient, you know, so um, they, uh, suffer, but also they have a compassion for, you know, like, like other, other lives, like this boy with dog. The background is also Dorothy Allen's class. Next one. And uh, uh, well, one of the important things also, you know, not just to, uh, just to survive, but also to strive by you know, educating the, the children, gave them opportunity. This is a, a group of migrant children reading books. Next one. And there's a, a, a photograph uh, in Kern County by Dorothy Line. 
a, a, a young teacher is, uh, you know, teaching migrant children. Some of, some of them didn't have shoes, really, uh, various ages. So based on this next one, I, I develop a, a, a painting. And it's more colorful. It's a, it's a uh, California sunset, but also, you know, to honor the teacher, the teachers, the people who care about, uh, you know, the, 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 the children in poverty. Next one. And then there are three, um, a series of uh, fashion water, which Dorothy Allen did uh, quite a few photographs. Uh, she, she followed one family or one person. She did more than one shots. This is a, 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 a group of children, I believe, are from the same fa family. They uh, try to get water during the, 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 the migration. Uh, here's the one. Next one. Then next one. I like this painting. Actually, the, there's something about uh, we hardly see anybody's face. I gave the youngest girl, uh, I decided she should wear red shoes. They are working together, moving forward. And next one. So um, I will end with this image. And uh, the two children looking at the different directions. I believe this is a photograph of, of the migrant uh, children in o Oregon, if I remember correctly. But uh, somehow, it's, a, it's a both very, uh, you know, uh, literal, but also I think uh, somehow very uh, symbolic about uh, looking back, looking forward. And uh, so I will, uh, next one, I would end with uh, my presentation with uh, uh, Elizabeth Partridge. Uh, she uh, is uh, uh, Dorothy Elaine's goddaughter, has published quite a few books on Dorothy Elaine, among others. But I really like what she said. Uh, she, she said, uh, Dorothy Elaine, my godmother, photographed the down and out as they struggled to hold on to their dignity in the face of a tremendous uh, adversity. She wanted uh, her photos to stir up observers into action to encourage them to work for political and social change. I think it makes uh, so much uh, you know, uh, sense, you know, today to the pre to, to the very present like what just happened you know so anyway thank you for the opportunity and uh, i will i think this is the end of my presentation thank you so much hong for sharing um your work in this presentation i would like to welcome back drew and paul to our zoom room um, to continue the conversation um, that will be moderated by Drew, and we'll share our audience questions with them as well. Yes, hello again. <clears throat> uh, I'm picking up on that, uh, the Hung's last slide with the quote from Betsy Partridge. Um, uh, uh, Dorothea Lang famously said that a camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. And I think that gets right to the heart of uh, her intentions, which is to help people see injustice and inspire them to do something about it. Um, I, to me, this strikes, this sounds like something that applies to all socially engaged art, not just photography. And in just, I wonder if you can uh, speak to the way how that plays in your art practice, particularly, you know, the relationship between art as a form of activism, uh, particularly in the light of current situation both with the coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter movement. Paul, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a journalist, so I'm covering this stuff, but I'm, I'm hoping that um, I really feel like as a journalist, I could feel like the art of photography can bridge that gap between the past and the and, and present and, and just help kind of communicate or kind of share those stories so they share those stories 
I, uh, uh, what I'm thinking is this, uh, sometimes you, you're absolutely right. We talk about a first hand experience, right? We always talk, I see if I have to uh, uh, be witness in the first hand mean, way means I had have to be there. I have to be there, see it, listen to it, smell it, whatever. But somehow, uh, through uh, uh, like a Dorothy Lance uh, camera lens, I felt because uh, she was uh, truthful, she was facing the the reality, no matter how, how terrible. But I felt because that telling uh, the truth, you know, being honest, uh, made me feel that I see if I had the first hand experience. Of course, it related to my personal experience as well. So I felt like, uh, no, this is a, like the, really like this. I can, I can feel it. I can smell it. So that kind of a, a journalist photograph is because in China we had a lot of propaganda. I could tell there's a, some just complete fake arranged. Everything's arranged. Even expression is arranged. You smile. You do this. You do. But I, I through her her photograph. I, uh, I felt like I was almost I was there with her. Yeah, she's able to have that. She's able to bridge that that gap and have a con human connection with her subjects. And that, and and her her subjects, their whatever they're feeling comes out in her photographs. She's able to bridge that gap and let them tell their story. And she doesn't. It's not like she's editorializing on it, but she's Absolutely. going to that situation, able to connect with this, her subjects, and they're able to somehow. She's able to like have that connection, and let them tell their story in their own way by expression or body language or whatever it was but there was nothing fake on it it's just, it's just she showed the really the unvarnished reality of what was happening that's uh that's very interesting because especially in light of the first question that we've received from a viewer uh which is lang's photographs didn't name people in them and the people didn't give the permission for their images to be used what are your thoughts about this? Is it okay if it serves a greater cause? Please clarify. And as the, as the curator of the collection, I, maybe I should jump in. And um, um, that's not entirely true. Uh, it's, it is true that she did um, not generally, if, if ever, really collect the names of the people. Uh, but uh, as far as the question of permission goes, her normal practice, and there, um, there were exceptions to this, uh, notably the migrant mother photograph, oddly enough. Uh, in general, her practice was to go in, as she said, talk with people for 10, 20 minutes uh, before even taking her camera out. The first thing she would say was, I'm from the government. Uh, she would uh, uh, make them, they would become aware that she was basically there to help and become very co cooperative and want to participate and feel relaxed uh, she'd said, she'd say, how many kids do you have? I have two and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, um, yeah, that, that would be my, my only response to that. Um, another question from an audience member. This is for Paul. In which camps, uh, the, uh, Celia would like to know which camps your parent, parents were interned at. Okay, for my dad's, my dad's side, they were in Tanfran, the racetrack, which is there in San Bruno. And then they went to the Topaz, they called it the War Relocation Center, which was uh, south of Salt Lake City in the desert. My mom's family was from San Jose and they ended up going, they were farmers. They had, they took my, my grandfather who had had a, suffered a stroke who was better and they took him to camp with them because they didn't want to leave him at home in San Jose because they thought he would not get good care. So they, they brought him to, to Santa Anita racetrack in Los Angeles. That's where they were sent and they had to live in the horse stall there. And then from there, they went to um, a camp by Lake Havasu in uh, Arizona called Poston. And that's where they spent most of the year, their years when they were locked up. Yeah, that's, that's uh, an important detail about being housed in horse stalls, which was true at Tanfran as well, because it was a racetrack. Yeah, yeah my dad was lucky and they, their family was able to have one of the regular barracks inside the oh, racetrack. Wow. And you know, that other point about 
permission and photographs you were talking about earlier. I mean, when I when I work, um, usually I'm I'm not pulling my camera up and shooting pictures right away. I'm having a conversation with the person I'm I'm photographing. Usually, there's some kind of dialogue because I, I want to know a little more of the background of their story. I'm trying to trying to sh tell their story, so we have that dialogue first before I even take out my camera. The only exception would be like, you know, I was covering the protests and stuff and you're on a public street and there's a lot of stuff. So you're just taking pictures of what is happening in front of you. Right. Um, of course, you know, documentary photography of people in uh, suffering under certain bad circumstances are always open to um, charges of being exploitative in some way. But I think what makes her photographs, uh, she's the exception to that in a very big way. Uh, and it's all based on that practice. And I think her history is her background as a portrait photographer. Um, I have a question from Hung, for Hung, excuse me. Um, sorry, it got sort of pushed up here. I beg your pardon. Um, this is from Barbara. Uh, she wants to know when and where uh, your paintings can be seen by the public. Oh, yeah. I have had quite a few shows actually based on Dorothy Lance photograph from New York to uh, LA to Santa Fe to uh, Idaho, uh, Ketchum, Idaho, and uh, Kansas City. So uh, get, get on my uh, website, which is just my name, hongliu.com. You will see the connection to the galleries of uh, other shows. I don't have to advertising here, you can see it, if you're interested. Yeah. And uh, actually, that window sleeve image, that big painting, right. you know, the man carrying a, you know, a, a bag with, in, a juxtaposed with a Dorothy Lance cloth, that's actually uh, in uh, Oakland Museum collection. Right. Um, Judith is asking if the museum is involved in preserving some of Oakland murals for the collection uh, and the possible exhibition. And I would say, yes, absolutely. We're, in, we're working closely with artists and organizations in Oakland, uh, including the Black Cultural Zone, to try to figure out the best way to preserve these artworks um, and continue to support racial justice work. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we feel has to be done in conjunction with uh, Groups to make sure that the that the the you know the artists are properly represented and and potentially compensated. Uh, another question: Meg wants to know: Is there evidence that her work stirred politicians to action, such as Franklin Roosevelt and others? That's a really interesting question. Wow. Uh, I you know uh, I, I don't think there's uh, there were some uh, federal funds made available for uh, migrant camps. And if you've all read uh, Grapes of Wrath or seen the movie, uh, uh, it was a very small ray of hope uh, that some of these camps were established and were real havens. Um, they never were widespread enough to anywhere near sufficient to cover the crisis on that. Um, and uh, as far as congressional support and politicians for support, um, while, while the Roosevelt administration and his New Deal policies were actively trying to help, that's why, these, uh, that's why these photographers were hired to go out and document this. They wanted to raise awareness. Uh, there were also a lot of politicians in Congress who thought the whole operation was just a communist plot uh, and that they were, you know, the photographs were being faked in order to raise sympathy under false pretenses. And so I'd say it's a very mixed response, but uh, I, I, it definitely raised public awareness generally and left a very important historical record. Um, ah, this is uh, uh, something that we've all been thinking about lately, which is uh, the role of the documentary photography. Lang, of course, was a trained photographer, but now basically everybody has cameras. They walk around with cameras on their smartphones every day, able to record acts of violence and oppression. Uh, I'm interested in both of you. How, what do you think about how this shapes our society? Um, well, I think that the phones or the videos, you know, you could post it right immediately, right? Correct. You know, on social media, I mean, everybody sees it immediately, but then 
a lot of times there's no, uh, I mean, for me, the way I work, I have to get names of people. Let's say I photograph somebody, I need their names, background, that kind of stuff. So when I'm writing a caption, there's a little more um, substance to the, to the image. Um, but I think it's, that's so, which makes it a little more, little different, but that immediacy of, of people shooting with the iPhone and putting up on, on the, for social media, it's pretty incredible that, you know. So, I mean, it uh, increases the number of uh, images that we're bombarded with. I mean, uh, you know, I think we see I think I read somewhere that we see more images uh, uh, in a week uh, than were taken in the entire first 150 years of photography. Um, so uh, I'm curious, uh, do, do, you, do you see it, do you think of the, on balance it's more empowering or do they, do they just, do these images just go by and... I don't know, I mean, there's some that are incredible, but I think some just kind of go by because some are not frame too well or you know or the the you know I mean not just videos but still still photos are not they're just not I don't know they're they're not uh, like a document like that they're feeling there's not a connection in the photographs there might be a, a snapshot you know what I mean or it's all these quick little things but there's no that emotional um connection with your subject in that photograph that I think is missing on a lot of them but then there's some that are so incredible that it's there you know some might just be like like the video with the sound and the stuff, but maybe the visuals don't look so hot, you know, frame that well, or, but the um, content for that part's there, but for like a lot of the still stuff that we see all the time, it's some of it, you don't know if it's like you said, fake set up, she was talking, you know, or if it's a real documentary moment. I mean, that's the real hard thing to figure out or the danger, you know, people passing up stuff that are set up as a documentary image as the truth. I'm told we have time for one more question, and this one is for Hung. I'd, I'd be real curious to know, um, one of the things I think you have in common with Lang is uh, you've all, your work has always dealt with ordinary people facing the effects of, uh, facing crises particularly, and the effects of big historical events. Uh, do you see a parallel between Lang's images of the Great Depression and incarceration and your paintings of revolution and refugees? Yes, that's why I, I, I was so drawn to her work, her not just uh, one or two images. I felt like uh, her as a, a artist. Now, you know, you can name her art journalist, uh, uh, general journalist, uh, photographer, whatever. But I, as a person, I think uh, uh, her, her heart is the right place, if I may say that, because uh, there's something about her. She, uh, I, I, she, she had a polio when she was young, right? So I, I, I think that there's a, uh, I think cool. She, she said that, uh, she, she, that left her life long, um, limp. Now she, she took like a little cripple. So she said, uh, I'm so, sorry, Hung Wei, your audio cut out at the... Because, you know, because of physical, but uh, because of growing up in the, you know, I was a refugee baby with, uh, with family mm -hmm. in China during the Civil War. So I, I think uh, it's interesting that connected to people who less know. Like we all said, they don't have a voice. We gave people a voice. I said, they don't have a face. We need to give them a face. So she defines the, the gener, uh, uh, generalization. You know, it's like a specific, their, appear, their appearance and their thoughts. So that's, I, I feel like, a, that's why I feel so connected to her. Sometimes I feel I when I went, went to visit her archives, it's like my program, but also such a, a private kind of connection the dialogue with her. So that's uh, that's how you, you're right. There's something about our great connection. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing and for the work that you do. Uh, this has really been a pleasure and very informative and inspiration inspirational. 
And now I'd like to turn it back to Patricia. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Thank you so thank much, you. Hank. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Drew. And thank you all for participating in today's program. In conversation, artists consider Dorothy Lang. We miss seeing you at the museum and look forward to welcoming you back when it's safe to do so. When you do come back, please visit the Gallery of California Art to see our newest Lang installation, which was installed in February just before Shelter in Place. Please be sure to check out our website um, at OMCA at Home section to see the digital version of the exhibition, educational resources, and stay tuned for our microsite of the Lang Collection, which should be out in late uh, July, early August. And be sure to sign up for an e-newsletter to learn more about upcoming online programs. Uh, we hope you were inspired and learned some things about Lang, about how artists document our world right now. Um, in closing, um, you know, Lang insisted that she was merely recording reality in the hopes that uh, she, by revealing the truth, people would be motivated to take action. Though Lang's activism did not take the form of community organizing or explicit protests, her pictures were um, designed to provoke social and political change involving questions of class, race, and justice. She endeavored to motivate Americans by helping them to see suffering and injustice by stimulating their empathy and by rendering faceless crowds into recognizable individuals. So what motivates you to take action? And what does taking action look like? How will you remember today? And how do you inspire social change? Share your thoughts with us by emailing feedback at museumca.org or tag us on social at Oakland Museum CA. We would love to know your thoughts. And thank you, everyone. Please take care. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.